This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Packed into the walls of Alasia, the warriors had been waiting since dawn. They knew this would be the end. But even now, it was still hard to comprehend. After months of bitter siege, the last stranglehold of the Gauls was to be surrendered to the might of Rome. The man who symbolized the fall of Alasia was Vercingetorix, brave chieftain of the Celtic warriors. With great dignity, he submitted to the chains of slavery. As he was taken into captivity, the Gauls must have known that their lives too would be changed forever. The age of the Celts was over. Now was the turn of the Roman Empire. The touching sights of the surrender of Vercingetorix at Alasia established Rome as the undisputed master of the Celtic people. By 50 BC, they were no longer free and proud peoples, but citizens of the empire. How the defeated Celts must have ruled the day 350 years earlier, when the boot had been on the other foot. In the year 390 BC, the Celtic warriors had carved a Roman citizen army into bloody ruin. It was they who had opened the way into the fabled city itself. Driven into their high citadel, the Roman citizens could only watch in despair as their once proud city was laid waste. Now they had had enough. Faced with starvation, the Romans agreed to pay a huge ransom in gold they would pay the barbarians to go away. Defeat had been total, but there was more to come. As the gold was being weighed, the warrior's leader, Bran, stepped forward and in a dramatic gesture, flung his own sword onto the scales with the words, Ve Victus, woe to the defeated. He wanted even more gold. Left with no other alternative, the Romans had to pay over the last of the gold in the city. It was a bitter humiliation which Rome would never forget. It would take time, but they would have their vengeance in full. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans. With exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. Our extensive catalogue of documentaries covers everything from the rise of Hannibal Barker to the illustrious treasures of King Tut. So sign up today for broadcast quality documentaries uncovering the mysteries of the ancient world. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code Odyssey at checkout. The Romans called the invaders, who destroyed their city in 390 BC, the Gauls. The Greeks knew them as the Keltor. The mists of time and the passing of centuries has obliterated much of their history. But there are those who argue that both names are still recognizable in Scotland and Ireland today as the modern Gaels and the Gaeltach, or community of the Gaels. Now the Gaeltach precariously survives only on the far western fringes of Europe and in the few relics of a once great power which dot the landscape of Britain. But in the fourth century BC, they dominated a vast swathe of land stretching from the Atlantic to the Black Sea and from the Baltic to the warm shores of the Mediterranean. The Celts were probably the most successful peoples of later prehistoric Europe and they had a culture which was very different from that of the Greeks and Romans but nonetheless it was in many ways much more sophisticated than a lot of people tend to suspect. They were, did not have a, an organisation which was based on the state, they had no concept of state, they had no concept of, of the kind of political system based on towns and so on that you find in the classical world. But, not despite that, they had a society which was very dynamic, materially very well developed. <laughs> 
Although classical writers were quick to dismiss them as savage barbarians, the Gauls and Celts enjoyed a rich and diverse culture. Their society was stable enough to encourage the widespread development of arable farming and consequently enjoyed sufficient food surpluses to support large, elaborately fortified towns and trade with the emerging Mediterranean nations. This, in turn, supported a surprisingly sophisticated economy. Many of the Celtic peoples had their own coinage. It was the Celts who devised the ringmail shirt, each of which required many man hours of work by skilled craftsmen. They also made agricultural tools, wagons, chariots, even ocean-going ships. The Celts were famed in the ancient world for their love of decoration and adornment. Most famously, their neck decorations, or torques, worn by many warriors. Often these were of solid gold. These personal effects usually went to the grave with their owner, as can be seen in this Celtic burial site excavated in France. As one would expect in these troubled times, Celtic society was dominated by the warriors. They formed their aristocracy in much the same way that later medieval societies would be dominated by the knights. The strict divisions in Celtic society are underlined by Julius Caesar's description of the three classes of Gallic society. Looking after the spiritual life of the people were the Druids, or holy men. Even today in parts of Britain, echoes of the Druids and their strange rituals still survive. Eerie monuments like Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain are their lasting legacy. Uh, one of the things that classical writers were particularly disgusted about was the fact that they practiced, as they saw it, human sacrifice. And um, some writers in particular went to town on uh, wicker cages filled with um, humans that were set fire to, and about um, the fact that they seemed to collect heads. Um, both these things, um, in more gentler times, people have tried to play down, but the fact is that archaeology has shown all too clearly that human sacrifice was part and parcel of Celtic um, belief. The next level in society were the plebs, or common people. Lastly came the warriors. Significantly, for this third group, he employed the Latin term equites, or knights, and described how, in times of war, they would take the field surrounded by their servants and retainers. The archetypal Gallic or Celtic warrior was said to be tall and muscular, fair-skinned, with red or blonde hair and blue eyes. As we have seen, the Celt loved decoration and he adorned himself with brightly colored clothing and exquisitely worked metal jewelry. He was supported by his own clansmen, whom he knew he could trust. Warriors were outfitted by skilled armorers who provided them with weapons famous for their quality throughout the known world. Like the later medieval knight, the Celtic warrior was trained from boyhood to be a fanatically brave fighter prepared to face his foe in single combat. He would fight on foot, on horseback, or even from a fast chariot. 
all our sources from the classical world looking at the Celts agree that they are war mad. Now, to us this may seem a, a strange way to run a society, but it's a way of competing and establishing a pecking order, essentially. And with the pecking order come, obviously, the material benefits of power and the ability to dispose of resources, people, cattle, crops, other goods such as that. When Caesar is, is writing in his commentary on the, uh, his invasion of Britain, that he was very um, puzzled and surprised by the fact that charioteers um, got out of rather the warrior in the chariot, got out of the, the chariot and ran along the chariot pole and got onto the backs of the horses when the chariot was in full pelt. And he thought this was a very daredevil thing to do. What he didn't realize is that this was one of the kinds of feats that they did. Um, they, uh, this was to impress the enemy with with their, um, uh, with their skills. Although chariots were little used in Europe after the Battle of Talimon in 225 BC, their use was still widespread in the British Isles. As the Romans would later discover to their cost, they could still be very effective fighting machines in the right hands. When it came to a real fight, Celtic tactics were brutally simple. Sometimes stripped naked and painted with woad, the Gaelic swordsmen stood in front of the battle line, while behind them were ranged their clansmen, armed with spears, bows, and slingshots. At the start of a battle, they would stand for a time, slashing their long swords, yelling abuse, and rhythmically clashing weapons against shields in a calculated attempt to intimidate the enemy. When it was plain that the enemy had been softened up psychologically, the warriors and clansmen rolled forward in an advance which steadily gained in momentum until it became a full-blown charge. If at this stage their opponents showed signs of wavering or even began to break and run, then the charge would be continued until they got in among the increasingly panic-stricken fugitives and mercilessly hacked them down with their swords. On the other hand, if the enemy stood firm, the Gauls too would halt, hurling both missiles and insults in a renewed attempt to stampede the enemy. If this still failed, they would then fall back to their original position and start the process all over again, repeating it as often as necessary until they were successful, or the enemy counterattacked. It was a tactical doctrine which could bring about spectacular victories if the enemy panicked. But it could just as easily result in utter disaster if the enemy held firm. For the majority of the next 400 years, that enemy was to be the Roman army. In its early years, the Roman army was a citizen militia organized on classical Greek lines. Time and time again, it was to prove no match for the ferocious Gallic charge. In 104 BC, however, in the wake of yet another defeat at the hands of a Celtic army, the Roman general Gaius Marius completely restructured the Republic's army. The short service militiaman was replaced by a heavily equipped and well-trained professional soldier. There is indeed evidence from antiquity that something very important happened in 105 to 104 BC. Uh, this is that uh, because of very major military threats from the Celtic and Gallic and Germanic tribes uh, to the north, um, Gaius Marius, who had already achieved success in defeating the Numidians in what is called the Jugurthine War, started uh, to raise new soldiers in order to fight in the north. Again, it was a prestigious and potentially profitable way of life, one which in many ways was preferable to the existence of a subsistence peasant farmer. Clearly there were risks, you might get killed, you might get maimed, but the potential rewards were equally great. With the restructuring by Marius, here at last was the backbone and foundation of an empire. On the battlefield, too, 
the army was thoroughly reformed. In place of the old system of lining up their army in three battle lines, it was organized into the famous legions of Rome. Each legion initially comprised of 10 cohorts or battalions. Ironically, in the early days, the men were often issued with Celtic-made mail shirt and helmet. But unlike the volatile Celtic warriors, the Romans were to learn to rely on discipline and sheer staying power to defeat their fearsome opponents. But it had been a long road. The first reported incursions by the Celts in Italy occurred about 400 BC. Taking advantage of the instability resulting from the expansion of Rome in the peninsula, the first to arrive were the Insubri, who made their capital at Milan. But they were soon followed by other tribes who conquered the whole of the Po Valley. Inevitably, the Celts and Romans soon came into violent collision. In 390 BC, a Roman army was destroyed just 10 miles north of the city. And a jubilant Gallic army then proceeded to plunder and burn Rome itself. As we have seen, the Celt war leader Bran allowed his army to be bought off with gold, and Rome was allowed to recover. It was a costly mistake. The Romans would ultimately exact a terrible revenge for the humiliation inflicted by Bran and the Celts. But first, there was to be some small respite. Distracted by the long drawn out Carthaginian wars, Rome ignored the Celts. As long as they kept themselves to themselves, they were allowed to live peacefully. This situation prevailed until the southward migration of two tribes, the Cimbrai and the Teutons, precipitated a crisis which would eventually lead to the destruction of the Celts. By the time of Julius Caesar, the Roman armies in the field were very different to what they had been in the second century BC. And I think the very crucial factor here is the change that resulted from a war called the Social War in 91 to 89 BC, as a result of which the entire population of Italy became Roman citizens. And that meant there was a much larger reservoir of manpower for the Romans to draw upon. It resulted in considerable problems for the Roman government. But I think this was uh, one of a number of factors that led to a general change. Conscription did not, in fact, come to an end. We know that even under the emperors, there was still conscription of soldiers in the provinces. So I think it's a gradual change. The new reformed Roman army proved to be ruthlessly efficient. In a brutal series of campaigns, the Cimbri and the Teutons were destroyed. Within 40 years, the boundaries of the Romans had been pushed northwards into France, driving the Celts back from the Mediterranean forever. It would not be long before their remaining homelands would be under threat. Those lands formerly ruled by the Celts in southern France and northern Italy were now two new Roman provinces of Gallia Narbonensis, more commonly known simply as the province, which has come down to us as the modern day Provence region. The other was Gallia Cisalpina. Together, the two provinces made up a huge amount of territory with a strong military presence. In 59 BC, both provinces received a new governor. The Roman army had been revolutionized, but it still lacked an aggressive and visionary commander. Now, it was to find one. He was an ambitious and able politician named Gaius Julius Caesar. Well, of course, we see Julius Caesar very much through the mirror of his own writings, which were designed to flatter. But there are plenty of other sources from the first century BC which tell us about Caesar because he was such an important and dominating figure in the middle of the century. In many ways, Caesar was a typical product of the aristocracy of the late Roman Republic, a highly ambitious politician who used 
bribery, military power, and persuasion and what we would call networking to advance his own career. He was certainly a military commander who throughout his life behaved as a commander in order to rival other soldiers. But at the same time as a scholar, he wanted to rival scholars like Cicero. He had enormous self-confidence, the kind of self-confidence uh, that we see in the way in which constantly when his armies were about to be defeated, he was prepared physically to hold, for example, standard bearers who were running away, turn them around and point them in the direction of the enemy. Caesar had proved his success as a general in Spain. Now he would seize the opportunity to lead a Roman army northwards into the very heart of the Celtic lands. For some time past, Rome had been interfering in Celtic politics, constantly trying to destabilize and weaken their cohesion. Above all, Rome's political strategy was to prevent the unification of the anarchic mix of Gallic tribes into a single confederation under a high king. The appointment of Julius Caesar was to coincide with the emergence of just such a threat. The Celtic tribe Edui, who lived in what is now central France, found themselves under increasing pressure from the Germanic Swabians and their famous warrior king, Ariovistus. In desperation, they enlisted the aid of another Celtic tribe, the Helveti. The Edui invited the Helveti to leave their Swiss homelands and move westwards to aid them against the threat of the Germans. The quickest way for the Helveti to reach their new allies was to cross the Rhone at Geneva and pass through a part of Gallia Narbonensis. They promised to do so peacefully, but it seems the newly appointed governor was spoiling for a fight. Caesar refused them passage and broke down the bridge at Geneva. He then barred their passage with all the troops he could muster. The Helveti were not seeking a quarrel with Rome, so they headed north instead and descended through the Jura passes into Sequani territory. But Caesar was not to be thwarted. Throughout his career, Julius Caesar proved to be capable of taking ruthless and decisive action when his interests were at stake. This was to be no exception. Although he was perfectly aware that they had come to join with the Edri and Sequani in fighting the Swabians, he claimed that the Helveti were a dangerous threat to the Pax Romana. Calling up reinforcements from his other province of Gallia Cisalpina, he crossed the border into Gallic land and decisively defeated the Helveti in a battle at Autun. I had all the horses sent away, out of sight, so that everyone might stand in equal danger and no one have any chance of flight. Then I addressed the men and we joined battle. By throwing down spears from their commanding position, the troops easily broke the enemy's phalanx and then drew their swords and charged. The Gauls were much hampered in this action because a single spear often pierced more than one of their overlapping shields and pinned them together. Then as the iron bent, they couldn't pull them free. With their left arms thus encumbered, it was impossible for them to fight properly, and many, after repeated attempts to jerk their arms free, preferred to drop their shields and fight unprotected. At length, exhausted by wounds, they began to fall back towards the hill about a mile away. They had gained the hill and our men were approaching to dislodge them when suddenly their allies marched up and attacked our right flank. We changed fronts and advanced in two divisions. The first and second lines to oppose the Helveti, the third to withstand the newly arrived troops. This double battle was long and furiously fought. And when the Helvetic could sustain our charges no longer, they resumed their retreat up the hill, and their allies retired to the baggage. The fight continued there well into the night, for the enemy 
formed a barricade with their wagons and poured down missiles on anyone who came near them. But after a long struggle, we captured the wagons and the baggage. Throughout the Mediterranean, in the small um, Mediterranean communities, where you have a large number of powerful people in the same place, you will have competition, and that competition very frequently results in violence. One of the things that the Greeks were always worried about was stasis, civil discord. The Greeks decided that in order to stop their aristocrats from killing each other, they would get them to run races at the Olympic Games. The Romans had a different idea. In order to stop their aristocrats from killing each other, they decided they would get them to go and conquer other people. The first thing that has to be acknowledged is that the Romans were what we would call imperialists. Now, imperialists are not fashionable these days, but nonetheless, that is what the Romans were. They were quite happy to conquer other people and rule them. The expansion of Roman power through peninsular Italy and then through the Mediterranean and the lands round about it came about through features of Roman society itself. Warfare was necessary for the average aristocratic Roman male. After the battle, the Helvetii began a headlong retreat, but short of supplies, were eventually forced to surrender and returned to Switzerland. Having thus removed any threat which the Helvetii may have posed to Gallia Narbonensis, Caesar ought then to have fallen back across the frontier. Instead, as soon became apparent, he had other ideas. His real object was to prevent Dumnoric, the leader of the Edui, from becoming high king of the Celts. Under no circumstances did Caesar wish to be faced with the united Celtic foe. There was one possible way out. Dumnoric was outside Rome. But his brother, Divicaiacus, was known to be sympathetic towards Rome. The wily Caesar immediately sought to win over Divicaiacus. He represented himself as the protector of the Gallic interests. To prove this, Caesar promptly attacked and defeated the Swabians, the enemies of the Celts. Well, Caesar had managed to destroy all his military opponents. What Caesar failed to do was win the support of the elite at Rome. And one reason for this was actually that he was too nice. He was nice to his opponents. One of his slogans was clementia, clemency. So in order to reintegrate people who had fought against him in the civil wars into his Republic, he gave them political offices, he gave them honours, but at the same time, of course, he had to reward the supporters who had helped him to win that victory. And that effectively meant there just weren't enough jobs to go round. The defeat of the Swabians was so far so good for Caesar. Next, he attacked the Sequani, and then on the pretext that he was upholding the wretched Divicaiacus's claim to the kingship of the Edui, he embarked upon the systematic subjugation of all the Gallic kingdoms west of the Rhine. In the face of this ruthless assault, the Celts' only hope was to unite under a single leader, a high king. By association with Caesar and his brother, Dumnoric had been neutralized. In the absence of a high king, the Gallic kingdoms were simply picked off one by one by the cunning and skill of Caesar. If they resisted, they were crushed in battle. On the other hand, if, like the Edui, they submitted without fighting, the best men were enlisted into the Roman army as auxiliaries. In this way, the Roman conquest became a runaway train. The more it conquered, the stronger and more invincible it became. Nevertheless, all did not always go entirely the Romans' way, and even Caesar had some anxious moments. During the fighting with the Nervi on the banks of the River Sambre in northern France, his men were starting to build their camp 
when the Gauls suddenly attacked, throwing them into confusion. Caesar was there and later recalled the event in his Gallic War. The men's movements were slow, and some in the rear, feeling themselves abandoned, were retiring from the fight and trying to get out of range. Meanwhile, the enemy maintained an unceasing pressure up the hill in front of us, and were also closing in on both flanks. As the situation was critical and no reserves were available, I snatched a shield from the soldier in the rear, made my way into the front line, addressed each centurion by name, and shouted encouragement to the rest of the troops, ordering them to push forward and open out their ranks so that they could use their swords more easily. Eventually, the Romans were able to counterattack and win the day. But once a tribe had been subdued, it almost meant that they would lie dormant forever. In 56 BC, for example, when the recently pacified Veneti revolted in Brittany. At first, it was a fairly straightforward matter. Some Roman officers were seized with a view to exchanging them for the hostages earlier given up by the Veneti to Rome. But this relatively minor act of defiance spiraled out of control into full-scale war. The Veneti were notable among the Celts as great seafarers, and their navy dominated both the Biscayan coast and the English Channel. They were therefore able to spread the revolt quite easily and obtain assistance from the as yet unconquered Celtic kingdoms along the Channel coast. Furthermore, their towns were generally situated on rocky promontories, which were extremely difficult to attack by land. Even when the Romans could succeed in breaching the land defenses, the Veneti simply evacuated everyone by sea and continued the fight elsewhere. The Veneti were one of the Celtic tribes living in what is now Brittany, or Armorica in Western Gaul, probably along the southern coast of the peninsula of Brittany. Like many coastal people, they clearly relied heavily on seafaring and navigation as part of their way of life. Unfortunately, we only know about them from Caesar's narrative when he came up against them uh, in war. Ships tend to be fairly elusive archaeologically. They tend to sink at the end of the day, or the bits of wood tend to be reused for other purposes. And actual Venetic ships are uh, basically lost to us. However, there are a couple of coins which have survived from um, the Iron Age in Britain, which show ships that appear to have been used in cross-channel trade. And these are plank-built vessels, fairly deep, and it is assumed that similar types of vessels were still in use in the Roman period. Recognizing that he was getting nowhere against his foe, Caesar decided that his first priority was to defeat the Veneti at sea. And so, for the first time, the Roman navy rather cautiously ventured out of the warm waters of the Mediterranean and into the deep and stormy waters of the Atlantic. By rights, the relatively lightly constructed Mediterranean rowing galleys ought to have been no match for the much more solidly built sailing ships of the Veneti. Only too well aware of their weakness, the Romans therefore avoided a direct confrontation on the open sea and instead brought the Veneti to battle in the relatively narrow confines of Quiberon Bay. Fighting in such a confined space gave the highly maneuverable galleys a crucial advantage. But not content with this, the Roman seamen devised a cunning plan to increase that advantage still further lashing what Caesar described as pointed hooks onto the ends of long pikes, they slashed at the rigging of the Gallic ships, cutting halyards and making them unmanageable. The Gallic seamen had no effective reply to this tactic, and conceding defeat began to fall off. Then utter disaster struck. The wind dropped altogether. Only the rowing galleys could still move, and the Romans simply picked off the helpless Veneti ships one by one. Only a handful 
managed to escape. Well pleased with this famous victory, Caesar exploited it to the full by moving north again and ruthlessly destroying the remaining Gallic kingdoms along the Channel coast. Then, having reached the Rhine, his attention turned to the mysterious island of Britain. Caesar lacked both the men and the resources to mount a full-scale invasion of the island. His military objectives were therefore confined to carrying out a reconnaissance in force. By doing so, he hoped to find out if it was feasible to mount an amphibious assault across the channel at a later date. His political objectives were also twofold. A successful raid on Britain would both emphasize the power of Rome to the Gauls in Europe. It would also enhance Caesar's own reputation in Rome. His campaigns against the Gauls in France were creditable enough, but to venture across to an island steeped in mystery on the very edge of the world was a very different matter indeed. Caesar left the world completely. He left mainland Europe. He went to this mysterious island in the ocean, the ocean of the rim of the world. To go to Britain is actually to go further than the known world, and this is what Caesar wanted to do. I... But neither expedition was much of a success. The dangers of expanding his fleet to the wilder waters of the channel were emphasized by a great storm which destroyed many galleys. How fortunate the Roman navy had been to avoid a battle against the Veneti in the open sea. Although Caesar was later to claim some tactical successes from his British invasion, the Gauls were unimpressed. The Romans and their great general had failed to conquer the British kingdoms. Inspired by this show of apparent weakness in their Roman overlords, a massive revolt broke out in the Auvergne in 52 BC. It was led by the man who was to be Caesar's most formidable opponent, Vercingetorix. We know something about Vercingetorix. We know that he had been thrown out of uh, his uh, family home and his tribe, the Aveni in Auvergne in central Gaul by his uncle Gobonitio, and it may well be that uh, he wanted to prove himself rather more than uh, other Gallic warriors, that he wanted uh, to use the occasion of Caesar's conquest of Gaul in order to show that he really was a quite unusual figure, a very brave fighter. He had himself um, nominated king of his tribe, which by this stage was actually quite unusual in the Celtic world. And perhaps what he really wanted to do was not really get rid of the Romans, but rather prove that he wasn't the failure that his family had stamped him as when he was younger. Thus far, Caesar had been spectacularly successful in picking off the Gallic kingdoms one by one. But now, Vercingetorix assumed the role of High King. Uniting the Gauls under his sole leadership, the war was renewed with increased ferocity. It was a measure of the High King's power and sheer ability that he was at first able to restrain his followers from rushing straight into battle with the first Roman army they encountered. Instead, he fought a war of scorched earth and guerrilla tactics. Avoiding pitched battles in which Roman discipline might have prevailed over Gallic fury, he instead burned villages and stripped the countryside of supplies forcing the Romans to rely upon increasingly vulnerable supply columns. Only the large Gallic towns were vulnerable. Their large populations and industries could not simply melt away into the vast forests as rural communities did. Nevertheless, they were strongly defended with high stone walls, and towns such as Bourges sucked the Romans into long and costly sieges. Eventually, Bourges was taken after a month-long siege and its inhabitants massacred as a terrible warning. Undismayed by this bloody war, Vercingetorix lured Caesar into a near-disastrous defeat 
at Jergovia. Although he knew that Vercingetorix and his army were in the area, Caesar was determined to capture the place. By ignoring the determination of his enemy, Caesar was to come close to disaster. Seeing his opportunity to end the revolt at a stroke, he concentrated his forces and launched an assault on the Gallic camps outside the town, while most of the men were away. The camps were quickly stormed, but with their blood up, many of the Roman legionaries lost their famous discipline and went on to attack the main defenses of the town. At first, it looked as though they might be successful, but Caesar had no reserves at hand to exploit their toehold. This gave Vercingetorix the breathing space he needed to organize a counterattack. It was to be a vicious affair, as Caesar was later to recall. Harassed on every side, our men held their ground till we had lost 46 centurions. When eventually we were driven back, the Gauls began to pursue us relentlessly, but were checked by the 10th Legion. As soon as we reached the plain, the legions halted, reformed, facing the enemy. Vercingetorix withdrew his men from the foot of the hill and led them within his entrenchments. That day, our losses amounted to nearly 700. Then the tables were abruptly turned. Caesar succeeded in breaking contact, but Vercingetorix went in pursuit and determined to destroy his Roman opponent once and for all, he devised a heavy ambush. Unfortunately, as so often happens in warfare, what should have been a diversionary attack developed into the real thing. Vercingetorix only intended to separate Caesar from his baggage, but instead his men got out of hand and a full-scale battle began before he was ready. Once again, Roman discipline prevailed in the end. Badly beaten, it was Vercingetorix's turn to retreat. It is a measure of just how badly beaten the Gauls were that Vercingetorix was driven back to seek refuge in another well-fortified town, Alesia. The days of guerrilla warfare were now behind him. Far from providing safety, Alesia was to turn into a death trap. This time, Caesar had no intention of repeating his mistake at Jergovia. With Vercingetorix safely sewn up within its walls, he could afford to take his time and conduct a proper siege aimed at starving the defenders into submission. The greatest siege of the ancient world was about to commence. Alesia stood on a lozenge-shaped plateau, on three sides of which were deep valleys, and on the western side was a small plain, about three miles broad. Caesar encamped his legions on the hills around the town, and after building a ring of 23 forts, he set his soldiers to digging a great series of ditches and banks, linking them all up in a continuous line. A timber palisade was built on top, and a network of small pits, man traps, was dug in front of the lines. Before the town was completely sealed off, Vercingetorix succeeded in sending his cavalry away to bring help. In the knowledge that they would certainly send a relieving force to come to the aid of Alesia, Caesar then set about constructing a second series of defenses. This time, they faced outwards, protecting the Roman camps and siege lines from just such an attack by a relieving force of Gauls. With the siege lines drawn tight, starvation stood at the door of every dwelling. Food soon began to run short in the town. Vercingetorix responded by expelling all those who could not fight, the old men, the women, and children. Caesar refused to accept them, and Vercingetorix refused to readmit them to the town. Some historians claim that the wretched townspeople then starved to death, but Caesar's own account 
suggests that the final battle took place so soon after this incident that they may well have been saved by the Gauls' eventual defeat. But first, there was a great deal still to be played out in the drama. As expected, a large relieving force had been assembled out of all the Celtic people. This huge force was banded together under a leader named Commius. They advanced and struck a hill not a mile away from the Roman lines. Caesar now faced a problem, so he split his forces to guard both the inner line of fortifications and the outer one as well. At first, the Celts simply attacked the ramparts head on in their usual reckless fashion. But when it became obvious that two Roman legions were stretched to their limits, they switched their tactics. Under cover of darkness, a substantial detachment moved around to the back of the legionary camp and next day launched an all-out attack. While the main body of Commius's army again assaulted the outer ring of defenses, Vercingetorix sallied out of Alesia to attack the inner defenses. The new attack actually succeeded in fighting its way into the legionary camp. At the second attempt, the outer line was breached. The ditch was leveled, and the Celts brought up the last of their reinforcements to exploit their breakthrough. It was a critical moment in the battle. Like tired boxers in a clinch, both armies were inextricably locked in combat. Neither side could retreat. They could only win or die. It was to be Caesar who grasped the chance of life. When I saw that my men were weakening, I sent Labenius to their relief with six cohorts, telling him to remain on the defensive if possible, but if he could not hold the camp by any other means, he must withdraw some other cohorts and counterattack. Meanwhile, I visited other parts of the lines, urging the men to hold out. On that day, I said, on that very hour, depended the fruits of all their previous battles. As the struggle grew fiercer, I led up a fresh detachment in person. We renewed the fight and succeeded in repulsing the attack. I then went to the aid of Labenius, taking four cohorts from the nearest redoubt, ordering part of the cavalry to follow me and sending another detachment to ride around the outer lines and attack the enemy in the rear. The enemy knew I was coming by the scarlet cloak which I always wore. And when they saw the cavalry squadrons and cohorts following me down the slopes, they joined battle. Hope had indeed gone for the Celts. Next day, Vercingetorix, accepting that all was lost, came out to surrender to Caesar. Some mopping up still remained to be done, of course, but effectively the Great Revolt was at an end. 
The Celts had finally been destroyed as an independent political entity. From henceforth, they would be absorbed into the growing Roman Empire. The age of the Gauls was past.